Today, we are thrilled to be sharing a conversation we had with Angie Atkinson about living in uncertainty all over again. This felt like a conversation shared between friends over a cup of good coffee, rather than a conversation held across time zones on our good old friend Zoom. We're so excited for you to be part of it. Angie dropped some great knowledge nuggets about control, taking our own advice, and building new tables. So grab a cup of coffee and enjoy. Before we get started with today's show, we've been talking a lot about how we're feeling and a lot of topics that we find interesting and important right now. But we want to know what you're going through, how you're feeling, really feeling, or topics you just want to hear more about. You can send your thoughts to beyondcamp at gocamp.pro, and we will add it to our brainstorming session for season three to start in fall 2021. Welcome to Beyond Camp, where we explore the intersection of camp and our lives. For too long, camp professionals have referred to camp as being in a bubble, and we're here to burst that bubble with you today. We know that camp intersects with every aspect of our lives, and we're excited to delve into those. We are your hosts, Rachel Kent. My pronouns are she, her. And I'm Cassie Bloy. My pronouns are also she, her. We're here to go beyond camp with you today. As a reminder, please subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening today. and Be sure to check out the show notes at gocamp.pro slash beyondcamp. Now, let's get started. Today, we are thrilled to be chatting with Angie Atkinson, all about living in uncertainty all over again, because we find ourselves, many of us, in a similar situation as we did last year. Angie uh, is the director of summer at Santa Catalina, and has spent more than a decade empowering girls in a summer camp setting, including as founding director of Camp Lantern Creek, an all-girls sleepaway camp in her home state of Texas. She's a facilitator and trainer for the Embody Love Movement, which empowers girls and women to celebrate their inner beauty through experiential learning around body image and self-love. She's a registered yoga teacher and Reiki practitioner, and previously hosted a podcast for educators called Brave, focusing on personal development and self-care. She loves to hike, explore national parks, anything beach-related, and has a cute lab mix named Dottie. You might also be familiar with Angie from the Women in Camp Summit. Welcome. We're so excited to have you. Hi, y'all. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for joining us. We're super excited as well. Um, So quite often, we like to start our podcasts talking about identity, because we believe it's really important that everybody has a chance to understand who we're talking to, and why it's important to address how we identify. So Angie, can you tell us how you identify? Sure. Uh, I would say the thing that I identify with the most uh, is being a woman. My pronouns are she, her. Uh, I am a white woman. I come from, um, I come from strong women. I come from uh, Texas and uh, I also hold a lot of power and privilege, you know, in that power and privilege circle, I stand very close to the center of it. Um, it just based on my identity and where, what our society is structured like. And so, um, you know, I, school uh, worked really well for me. Um, I um, am fairly neurotypical, um, cisgender. Uh, I am very spiritual, which is another thing that I um, highly identify with. Um, And then I would say that one of the things that, where I don't uh, necessarily hold a, a lot of power and privilege is that I experience a lot of anxiety. And um, that uh, in some ways I would say, you know, perhaps has presented a lot of struggles for me, um, both personally and professionally. And in other ways, um, it's really part of what has made me step into the things that I love to do and, and um, made me be deeper in my work as um, somebody that empowers girls and women. Amazing. I love that nice big broad spectrum that you included everything from like, this is what I look like to this is what I believe and how it's a part of me. And you know, started talking about your privilege a little bit there. How do you recognize your privilege when you're in various settings? Yeah, so uh, I quite often the the thing that I do the um, the most is, you know, I'll just share my pronouns. Um, and then I also you know, just sharing a little bit about my identity. And then I just acknowledge like that I hold a lot of power and privilege. Um, You know, I, uh, everything from like, I think the things that you can see about me to the things that you can't, 
Um, and so just acknowledging that that's my lived experience and um, that other people that I work with, whether I'm learning from them or I'm guiding them, um, may have different experiences. And so just um, I have learned through uh, my own work in anti-racist work and social justice work just to, to really just identify it. And then the other ways I think that I try my best um, kind of in a more of like daily fashion is to lift up voices um, that may not um, have as much access. Um, so lifting up, you know, just voices that um, may, may have an identity that is not part of the dominant culture um, and just continuing to uh, makes use the access that I have to make space, um, but not just to make space, but like help build new tables um, because I, I don't necessarily belong at every table. So um, there needs to be other spaces where, you know, they're, they're not necessarily led by uh, white women. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. Thanks so much for uh, sharing that. I love the build new tables. I think that's really key. And um, that thought's going to stick with me for a long time after this, I think, because I think so often we talk about um, the importance of inviting people to tables, but maybe we just need brand new ones that look different and function differently. So mm, I love yes. that. Thanks for sharing that. We try really hard to talk about identity and privilege because we really want to normalize it and have it be part of um, quote unquote mainstream culture and discussion. Um, so that these, and I think we're well on our way there. I think, uh, I shouldn't say well on our way there. I think we're on our way there. Um, and I think when we spend time with young people, it reminds me of how much progress we've made. So I mentioned earlier that we are in a similar situation to the one we were in last year. Um, and I say that because uh, at the time that we're recording this, it's sort of mid-March. Um, the world for us was starting to shut down where I am at least uh, here in Ontario, Canada. Um, and there was a lot of uncertainty last year about a lot of things and in a lot of ways that still exists now. For you personally, where are you at with uncertainty right now? Uh, why don't we start with in a, at a professional level? Yeah, sure. Um, I think I'll throw in kind of a caveat here at the beginning when I start to share some of my story and also some of my ideas and thoughts and opinions. And that's, you know, I, um, in my work as a camp director, and then I also am a coach. So I like work with, with women and groups like outside of my, my job job um, and empowering them. And um, so I'm like a, a super big like sociology, psychology nerd. And I, you know, that work is steeped in that. Um, also, I'm not a psychotherapist and I'm not a psychologist. So um, I, my, all of this is like, you know, um, definitely the things that I say are researched, but also like come from a, you know, a, my lens is very spiritual. Um, and so I will talk a little bit about anxiety and some different and uncertainty and some different like tips and tools and also like just acknowledging as somebody that experiences anxiety um, and mental health like if it's if it's deeper for you to please like make sure you're seeking professional help um, that you know take what take my thoughts take my ideas um, and let them guide you and then if it doesn't work for you or um, you need something else like please go do that I'm not um, I'm I leave the caveat that I'm not a psychologist. So um, it's Thank just you. a pa passion of mine. <laughs> we always appreciate that. We always yeah. encourage folks to seek out uh, the correct help that they need in there. Yes, their yes. Time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so uncertainty, um, where, I, where I'm at professionally is I uh, run a camp in the state of California and California is pretty far behind um, things being open as to, compared to the rest of the United States. Um, I'm not sure about uh, Canada, um, but we're, we're just have been moving slower. Um, and uh, e even that includes like, we didn't shut down in, until a little bit later. Um, and uh, the county that I am in has literally been shut down since July. So like, it's very bizarre to like, look at other people in other parts of the country and they're like hanging out. And I'm like, you're going to the movie theater? I'm really confused right now. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, it's, you know, that's part of even the uncertainty is that like, it, it really is, looks different depending mm -hmm. on where you live. Um, and that <clears throat> as far as camp goes, is affecting like how I'm planning and uh, what enrollment looks like and what you know my relationships with my campers and my parents and my staff look like and so 
um, while things are looking good and we have um, some pretty like feeling good about the predicted things that will happen and modeled, you know, like model A through F for the summer, um, we, we still don't have like the yes, we can have camp and the state of California yet, um, specifically resident camp. And so um, for me, uh, <laughs> um, how I am sitting with that is I'm like, well, I will plan for it and it's not in my control. So um, I say that and it feels easy. Uh, and I will, I will share that that is because I have had an immense amount of experience in my own personal being um, with how to learn how to handle uncertainty. Um, and so I am somebody that I didn't know that I was experiencing anxiety until I was 28, um, which was like a little over five years ago. So like I, I experienced this literally my entire life, but I didn't know that I was experiencing high levels of anxiety um, with what's called intrusive thoughts, um, which is like a very unhelpful thought that just like for me it like repeats in my head over and over and over again and um also thoughts around like disordered thoughts around eating um and so like my personal journey has been like um kind of like on the like the the end where i'm not all the way like experiencing ocd or i'm not all the way experiencing an eating eating disorder but like i'm right there where like I, I struggle with a lot of those things, um, which is interesting because like in psychology, just like I think a lot of things are, everything's more of a spectrum. It's not like mm -hmm. you're this or that. So um, with that, like what anxiety is essentially is like being afraid of the unknown, the uncertainty. Um, and it's it can come from like so many different things. It can come from experiences in our brain chemistry and just personal story and interpretation and just how it is in, you know, in me and um, it will be different for each person, right? Like what, how that, whatever that anxiety is, if you experience anxiety and you could be somebody that's like me, who's like experienced your whole life and it's high levels. Um, or you could be somebody that's like experiencing situational anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, with that, like I, my my stuff essentially all kind of came out of um i'm highly sensitive um i'm an empath so like i feel a lot of emotions and i feel them in my body um like if somebody else is feeling sad i feel sad um and not just i feel empathy for you but like i literally feel like it's my sadness um and when I started therapy, I learned that that's like a real thing, that that's, there's like a category of people that are highly sensitive and it's about 20% of the population <laughs> and um, they tend to have like more anxiety. And it was like, just kind of this huge, like opening in my life of like, oh, okay, I'm, there's not anything wrong with me. This is how my brain experiences life. And now I get to learn don't have to be afraid of the unknown and I don't have to be afraid of things being uncertain. And so some days are like today where I could be like, yeah, I have no idea if we're going to run resident camp and I feel great about it. And uh, part of me doesn't, part of me cares so deeply about the kids, but part of me, like, I, I don't care about like the attachment to it um, mm -hmm. because it's not, it's not my job to care about it. Like I can't control this huge, big worldwide pandemic thing. So I can be at peace with it. Um, if that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I think so. I like that. And I like that you're recognized that it's sort of like ums and goes, um, ebbs and flows, one might say. Um, I think that's very true. And I think this is a really challenging time for folks experiencing anxiety, even those like folks who haven't, um, are perhaps experiencing it for the first time, because there's so little in our control. Um, you know, the fact that like we are being told we can't go to the grocery store more than once a week, like that's a, a strange place to be in for many of us. Um, and all mm -hmm. of us have experienced different levels of that as well. Um, so I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, I'm just like, I'm loving this pocket of like, this is what I can control and do versus this is what's out of my control. And it's there and it exists, but I can focus on these other pieces as well. And I like that differentiation of them. 
but as we continue to sit in this, how do you think time has played a role in people adjusting to uncertainty as we like move into like the start of year two of this life of unknowns? That's a great question. I really would say it probably depends on each person's experience. Mm -hmm. um, I think something that I continue to reflect on um, it, it is partly like I, I have learned how to navigate my inner world um, and, and to learn how to create safety for myself so that I am less anxious. I, I've learned to create more, more like foundation so that I trust myself no matter what's happening in my environment around me through like a lot of therapy and a lot of like healing and, and ex like inner self exploration. And like with that, I really love to connect to the, to like the bigger picture. Um, so you can call that spirituality. You can call that just like the bigger picture, um, depending on what words resonate with you. Um, for me, spirituality has nothing to do with religion. Um, it has everything to do with just like connecting to the greater world around me that it's, I'm not just like in my box thinking about me because that's the thing that's gonna like make everything feel more uncertain and more, you're more anxiety inducing. Um, so I like to really like zoom out and look at it and like, it's like, well, time might be playing a factor but also like we were never in control of anything in the first place like no human is in control of life we just like to think that we are and we like to think that we are because it's a human need to have safety you know like in our brains we need safety we need safety for survival um, it's a human need to have love and connection and so all of this is playing a role in how we're responding to the uncertainty whether you know, it's about whether camp will run or what's our life like, um, you know, as we're going through this pandemic and as the pandemic shifts. And so, you know, I really think the pandemic has just highlighted this huge reality for all of us, which is that we were never in control in the first place. And so then we might like be bumping up against the ways in which we felt like we were in control. And then we perceive that we're, we're like, oh, well, I, I, I'm really anxious because I, I can't control it anymore. Well, actually you weren't controlling it before. You were just thinking you were and you were just doing things that made you feel safe. So there's always other things that will make you feel safe. You just have to explore what those are. And so I think as time goes on, what I've seen is some people have relaxed into it and some and are like rolling with the flow and some people are not, you know, some people are like kind of on the other end of it um, and are like even more anxious. Um, I personally think that my experience of it is as like a roller coaster. Like I've heard people say the Corona coaster. So it's like yeah. some days uncertainty is totally fine. Like it's like today, like I'm like, ah, it's, I'm feeling great about it. I'm feeling great about everything, going along, doing my work, everything's taken care of. And then there's other days where it just like is like I'm exhausted and I miss people and I miss my family and I hate this <laughs> and you know the uncertainty boils up and it's not just the anxiety but it's just the like I hate this like it just sucks and yep. um yeah so I think time's a little bit funny with it I just I think everybody's a little bit different with it and looking at this this summer I think that in our industry with camping I think that there's a lot of concern about you know what's what's happening in the camping industry as a whole um if you're a small camp like are you closing are you staying open you know, there's kind of those types of worries um and there's other other worries as well. It's like, how am I going to serve my kids? Um, are, are our campers traumatized? Uh, what mental health things do we need to take into account for them? And I, I would say like, if you're asking those questions, fantastic. And based on the like, what this podcast is, like also ask yourself those questions and make sure you're, you're supporting yourself first um, because you can't support your your staff or your kids this summer if you haven't if you haven't like grounded yourself and you haven't 
reached out and had like, you know, feel supported and you have, uh, who, no matter what it looks like for you, um, you know, you need to have people in your life that are going to be there for you that are helping you process all of this. Absolutely. Um, I re- like, we have to take care of ourselves before we can care for others. And I always used to tell my staff, uh, self-care is camper care because they'd always be like, I don't have time to take care of myself. I have to do things for the campers. I'm like, no, no, you taking care of yourself is like better for the campers. Yes. Um, before we head into our ad break, I'm wondering if you just have a cup, couple quick tips for camp pros as we continue to sit in uncertainty. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think that if you feel like you don't know how to deal with uncertainty, know that you do because you help kids every single summer deal with uncertainty because when a kid is homesick, homesick, they're dealing with uncertainty. They're dealing with the unknown of what it's like to create safety for themselves outside of their home and to trust other adults. And honestly, like we're all just big kids walking around in adult skin suits. So you just need to treat yourself like a little kid sometimes and recognize that when you're feeling uncertain and you're feeling scared that you just need some of those same things that you give your campers that are homesick, which is like, acknowledge your feelings, put some boundaries for yourself. Like don't wallow too much. (laughs) I mean, I love to give kids like, okay, so we're going to talk for 20 minutes and then we're going to move on. And then the next night it's 10 minutes and the next night it's five minutes, you know, so they're, they're not sitting in, in the like, it's the same thing for us. Um, Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you also need to then folk like refocus yourself and uh, I will nerd out on some psychology real quick. So this, there's this really cool thing called our reticular activating system, which we actually use with campers all the time. And so, you know, um, you know, when like you, I don't know, find out like when I found out um, several years ago, the first time my sister got pregnant, all of a sudden I started seeing pregnant women everywhere. Oh yeah. Right? Like, you know, that phenomenon. So it's not like all of a sudden there was more pregnant women. It was just that my brain was more attuned to thinking about pregnant women because I had somebody in my life that was pregnant and it mattered to me. So our brain actually like deletes a whole bunch of information constantly because there's too much coming in, um, you know, into our system to process. So it's, it's like the same reason why sometimes like you like, you're like, where are my keys? And they're right in front of you and you don't see it. It's because your brain like deleted the information for a second because there's too much happening. Um, so so um, your reticular activating system like does a whole bunch of things. But one of the things that it does is it helps you like pay attention to certain things. And so you can actually take advantage of it. It's why people do gratitude lists or why we tell a kid like, hey, tell me like something you're excited about, about camp. Like, tell me three things. You're like, we're literally getting them to work with their RAS, their reticular activating system, to begin to to stop focusing on the things that aren't going well and start focusing on the things that they're excited about. And like, what we know is that we, we get to hold the complexity of like, oh, I feel sad and I'm gonna have fun at camp. So it's like that for us, like, oh, this is uncertain and I feel anxious and like, oh, well, look at like what I get to do here at home and look at a little bit of extra me time I get. And, you know, you can continue to, to build your list so that what you're doing is you're training your mind to start to see the things that are going well. Um, and then the more you do it, the more that your mind will start to pick up on the things that are going well, just like, you know, I started to see more pregnant women. It wasn't that it was all of a sudden more pregnant women. It was that I was attuned to it. Right. Mm -hmm. So the same, like same thing. So that I'm attuned to it. I, it's going to be easier for me to be like, oh my gosh, look at this really great thing that just happened in my life. I feel really great about it versus like, I'm like over here, like really focused on the anxiety or, um, or making uncertainty feel, uh, mean fear or mean bad Mm -hmm. uncertainty actually can mean adventure and excitement and all of the cool things Um, i really like that yeah that's great thanks so much for sharing that um and also now when my partner's like 
Rachel, how have you lost your keys for the 10th time this week and you aren't even leaving the house? I'm going to be like, there's just too much information in my brain. My brain had to delete it. There were other thoughts. So thank you. That's my other (laughs) takeaway from that. Yeah, I was thinking the exact same thing going, that's why when I put my stuff down, especially when I was working camp, I would have a waste pack and I would fill it in the morning. And as the day progressed, it would empty. And then I'd sit down at my desk at the end of the night and go, huh, where is everything? Where'd it go? Where'd it go? But uh, we're going to take a quick break for our ad read today. And we will be back with some more amazing discussion with Angie. AC Illinois has deep roots in using camp as a way to create social change in local, state, and national communities, including creating equitable access for all children to attend camp. They are committed to creating social change that extends beyond the borders of camp. Just looking at their calendar of professional development activities shows this commitment. They're running workshops on understanding, identifying, and stopping microaggressions, as well as camp book clubs, which provide safe places for camp pros to reflect and share perspectives on different issues. ACA Illinois spends many hours fundraising and advocating for all children to gain access to camp across the state. They have campership funds to support these efforts, and 100% of the funds raised go directly to sending kids to camp. You can donate today at acail.org slash donate to be one of the many that play a role in a child's life. ACA Illinois also provides great resources for families, campers, and camp pros alike on their website. They recognize that camp doesn't stop once you leave the property and are committed to supporting their community through all of life's challenges. Join our community today at acail.org. All right. We are going to dive right back into this amazing conversation, talking a little bit more about some of what we started with, but diving a little bit deeper as well. So Angie, you started talking about boundaries earlier. We love a good boundary, but how do you intentionally set those boundaries during this like time of like, really good things that can happen in these times when we're like feeling really anxious and uncertain with everything. And how do we really acknowledge and honor that? Great question. And I would say that's something I have to work on every day Um, because I, like many people, um, am working all in, working and living all in one space um, in my apartment. Uh, I actually have an office I could go to, but I choose to stay in my apartment right now because I, I'd prefer to. Um, and and at the same time, like there are times when I'm like, wow, I'm in my apartment all day long. Like <laughs> what's happening? Um, so um, yeah, so boundaries, I think apply to our time right now and um how much time we're spending on planning for camp and how much time we're spending on worrying for camp and how much time you know we're you're spending in work versus you know you're living your life and making sure that you're um not just taking care of yourself but maybe your family or um the community around you as well. So having all of those different connections. And so I, I think that boundaries look different for every person. Um, and I, I find that for me, the biggest thing in this last year that I have found helpful in putting boundaries around is kind of twofold. One is I just simply refused last year to plan more than like four options for camp I I know everybody had their own like way of handling that last year and that was one like I recognize I've been part of a bigger organization so I it was maybe a little bit easier for my budget to be able to do that and I I really think that like planning 20 different things is also a coping mechanism and it's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. And also like you can start to ask yourself, like, are you doing that so that you feel more in control so that you feel better? And, and can you recognize like maybe that uh, is also draining you and is also making you more tired and isn't necessarily supporting your mental health. And if you like truly, like if your organization truly needs all of those different things, then yes, please do it. 
and also like maybe it's your reaction to what's happening and we always have choice and so you could choose to say no I'm not I personally chose to say no I'm not going to get on the slack that was created which was some people found really helpful some people found really really reassuring I found it to, to be just like too daunting and there was just too many people with too many opinions. So I just was, I was not on it. I didn't get on like the summer camp pros Facebook group um, for, for a chunk of time last year. Cause it was my boundary. Like that's what I needed. And then, you know, now we're in a whole different space. And this, this year I did plan for more. I did have more models and like, I have continually had to boundary like the questions I get from staff and parents of like well what about this and I'll, I will just say we don't know yet and when we get there I will let you know there's not enough information yet for me to make a decision and that's just where we're at and I'm I'm not going to hold on to I'm not going to scramble around to try to find solutions and answers for every person I just have to continually like stand in the boundary that like I don't know. And I also trust that my team will figure out what we have to do when we have to do it. I really like the honesty of saying we like we don't know yet. Uh, and I think that often our staff and the people in our lives need that or like deserve that honesty from us. We just don't know. Um, here's where we are. I have a question about boundaries because I respect people's abilities to set boundaries and am uh, arguably often bad at them. And my reason for that is that I definitely have a significant fear of missing out, but also a fear of missing something that will help my career advance, especially in this time of uncertainty where things are up in the air. I'm a younger camp pro. I don't always feel the most established. How do you balance boundary setting with those factors? That's a good question. Um, I, I really like the philosophy that like whenever you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else or vice versa. When you say no to something, you're also saying yes to something else. I feel like I learned this from Dr. G, I want to say. Yeah. Um, she's awesome, as we know. And I want to say it was like at a conference session. And it's so great because like, I want, to, I want to say she was teaching us like how to how to t teach campers and staff to sit like it's okay to say no because like when we say no out of safety we also say yes to something else in our lives and, and in their lives and so like I think as far as FOMO goes which I totally get I've experienced and like it, it all comes back to um, making sure that you understand that you can trust yourself like like I just said I can I trust my team will figure it out like we all need to just take a moment like each individual and trust yourself that you're not going to miss out on anything that's already for you and that you know you'll you'll get the things that you need in your life and that when you you're allowed to say no to a webinar or uh, a potential opportunity or um, some sort of learning, or like I said no to to some of the professional development last year, like the Slack, it was great stuff. Like there's so many like great ideas and I said no to it because I had to say yes to my mental health. And so that always helped, like that version of boundaries always helps me uh, navigate FOMO. And then I think, uh, I, I think I forgot to say this when I was talking earlier. The other thing I would say is I, I also like, put, I love to put boundaries on conversations with people. Like I, I just hung out with some friends like in an outdoor setting this weekend and I was like, no COVID talk and no work talk. And uh, we all work together. And so everybody agreed, but we also like made it funny. So we're like, if it came up because it's gonna come up cause we're living in it. Like we just had to do a dance move and then we would change the subject. And so I think like, I think that can also help. It's like. I don't know, some of the FOMO, sometimes I'm like, oh, we gotta all talk about what's happening. And it's like, actually, like, we could talk about like something nonsensical and relax and enjoy life a little bit. Well, thank you for that advice. I felt like it was tailored perfectly to me and I'm sure <laughs> Cassie feels similarly as well. So I appreciate that. Exactly. I'd love to have a conversation that doesn't have to do with work or COVID one day. <laughs> 
it seems to be just, it's what we, ha- I feel like it's what we have some days. But uh, one of the other things that I keep thinking about and keep finding coming up is like these overly optimistic outlooks. But then like, is that like just, you know, generic optimism or is it toxic positivity? Wow, that toxic positivity. We're going to try that again. (laughs) How do you like find that balance and address like that toxic positivity, but honor their optimism at the same time? That is a great question. And I definitely think uh, one, I know I've navigated several conversations with it and I, I feel like I've been on both sides of it where uh, like last summer I, I love to create new programs and I like very much just love like the entrepreneurship of new starting new things um, and so once I moved through the like grief and stress of canceling last summer and we ran virtual camp I then was like this is going to be so much fun. We get to create a new program. And was like, I very much was the person saying like, this is such a great opportunity. (laughs) And I had people around me that were like, no. And they just weren't there yet. Like they were, they were like still in the needing to process and there was nothing wrong with that. And then I've been on the other side of it where like, I had somebody telling me like, this is such a great opportunity. Look at how cool, many cool things you're going to create. And I, I was like, no, this sucks. Like, leave, leave me alone. I do not want to speak to you right now about any sort of opportunity that's happening because I'm just like heartbroken. And so I, I think that it's a really great example of everybody processes differently and at different paces. And so like when we're all coming together, we really have to make sure that we're being transparent and that we're doing like an emotions check-in of like, here's where I'm at. Because if you're coming in and you're like, I'm feeling very like sad and overwhelmed and anxious, or like I have a lot of grief, then that's going to be your lens that's like influencing what you're creating. And there's nothing wrong with that lens. It's just as like the reality of where you're at versus if you're like having a day that you're like, this is going to be great. Like, look how many cool things we're going to create, then that's going to influence your lens as well. And so I think that the solution to that would just be transparency and vulnerability and empathy. I think, you know, Brene Brown so well uh, talks about how empathy drives connection versus, you know, sympathy that like, uh, those, those phrases of like, at least, at least blah, 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 at least this, which can be a little bit of like, but look at this opportunity, which I, I said last year, (laughs) um, you know, that drives disconnection. And it's also like in the world of like yoga, people will call it like spiritual bypassing. So it's just like being like, everything's love and light. It's so great. And, that's not like what to me what like spirituality is really about it's about like living a human life and being connected to the greater world around us and so I think when we bring in empathy and acknowledgement and compassion we create connection and love and safety and that will be okay no matter where you're at no matter if you're having a day where you're ready to take on the new opportunities or if you're having a day where you're just not about it and everything feels hard and sticky and you know uh, a little bit like just difficult to move forward it's almost like you need to be able to read the room to know where people are and are ready to engage in those conversations um but i agree with the at least somebody once said to me they're like well at least your campers aren't like I was upset about camp and they're like at least your campers aren't really sick or like no one's dying or something like it was very it was a dramatic statement I was like well yes like I'm grateful that isn't happening but I'm still sad (laughs) like I can hold those two emotions um so like that's important there um Andrew it's been so incredible chatting with you and you just have so much to share so I thought to wrap up if you could give a piece of advice to a camp pro last summer like looking back let's say last June May or June what piece of advice would you give them I would say 
take it one day at a time just like you do every other summer so like as camp professionals we know that in a quote-unquote normal summer normal year whatever that means anymore that literally every day of camp is different and that one day you can have like two toilets overflow and six snakes on campus and three kids have to go home and and I don't know like also the best talent show in the world and then you can also have a day where like nothing like really happens like it's just a pretty normal cool day and you get to go to bed on time (laughs) and so it's so like yeah I feel like honestly it's like just take it one day at a time like you would anything else because we're not in control we never were in the first place uncertainty doesn't have to mean anxiety it doesn't have to mean fear it can mean adventure and if you don't always feel like that that's okay and you know you'll you'll get through it because you've gotten through every other thing in your life and so like instead of thinking about all the things that could go wrong, look at all the evidence in your life that has put you into the place that you're in now. And you're like, you're 100% successful at getting through all of the hard things because you're here. Amazing. I like that ending point right there. We're camp pros. We do hard things. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us today Angie it has been an absolute pleasure listening and learning from you again um, I always learn something new and exciting every time we chat so uh, if anybody would like to reach out to you and hear more or connect with you how can they do that sure so I nor- have a website but it's under construction right now so the best way is Instagram. Uh, I'm on Instagram at Angie.Atkinson and my name is A-N-G-E. There's no I. Um, Atkinson is just like it sounds. And that's the best way. You can also find me on Facebook. Um, Normally I do have a website that's AngieAtkinson.com, but it's, if you go there, there's nothing there right now because I'm redoing it. (laughs) Excellent. Thank you so much again. And we want to thank everybody for joining us beyond camp. We hope that you were able to connect, reflect, and with us as we journey beyond the property lines and bring camp with us wherever we may go. As we wrap up, we also want you to be able to reach out and connect with us. So you can reach myself, Cassie, at cassie.bloy at stefanricard.ca. Rachel? Folks are always welcome to send me an email at kentar at girlguides.ca. Please remember to check out our show notes at gocamp.pro forward slash beyond camp. Another great big thank you goes out to Angie for making the time to be here today, to the team at Go Camp Pro for holding space for these conversations, to ACL, ACA Illinois for their sponsorship and support of this podcast and our many ideas, to our producers Matt and Jotham for making sure we sound amazing every week and taking care of all the back end work, and to you, our listeners, for making the time to listen. Your dedication allows us to keep moving forward. Beyond Camp is part of the Go Camp Pro podcast network. Check out all our other podcasts at gocamp.pro forward slash podcasts. Well and safely, friends. We'll see you next week.